deep in the open waters of the Gulf of Alaska, a violent storm threatens the safety of a sailboat captain. I've already suffered numerous knockdowns and uh, my fear was that the next one might inflict uh, some further damaging wounds. Well, the second I get down to the boat, I'm like, holy cow, this guy's been out here for eight days. While closer to Sitka, a fishing trip takes a tragic turn. Oh, buddy, be alive. And when a young girl must get to higher medical care, the Coast Guard is the only option. When I hear that it's a two-year-old child, it kind of ramps everybody up. Uh, obvious reasons, most of the guys on, on the crew that day had kids. So movement is a priority. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. An E-perb is going off up near the Fairweather. And uh, I guess the E-perb is registered to about a 30-foot sailboat. Um, unknown number of people on board, unknown status of its uh, equipment on board, like it's got a uh, life raft or anything else. All they know is there's an e perp going off, so it's uh, probably an hour and 45 minute transit from here. My name is Will Walker. I'm a lieutenant commander at Air Station Sitka, Alaska. And uh, we were launched on a, uh, an e perp that was detected by Sector Juno and District 7 Command Center. The EPIRB was apparently registered to a 31-foot sailboat named ETAC, and it's, it was, uh, the position it transmitted was in the vicinity of the Fairweather Fishing Grounds. It was about 60 miles offshore of Yakutat, Alaska. When we hear that there's a boat in distress that far offshore, a C-130 has launched from Air Station Kodiak. They're gonna be transiting out there while we're getting out there. But I expect they'll get on scene about 10 or 20 minutes ahead of us because they, uh, even though they're coming far, farther away, they fly faster. Park breaks off, see if switch is thrown. I'm off. Clear on the left before takeoff, check your crew forward take off. Ready for takeoff. We are airborne from Air Station Sitka at this time. We have 04 persons on board in route for SAR. Request you assume our radio guard at this time. Over. 03 sector, you know, Roger. Thank you. I go on so much today, camera. Do whatever we need, sir. The, uh, with the wind spotted in there, about an hour and 10 minutes in route. Okay. When we're taking off, covering that amount of distance. We might fly through several weather patterns en route, and the weather there could be completely different. It might be better than it is here now, or it could be significantly worse than it is here. Uh, unfortunately, there are no weather stations that far offshore, so uh, we just kind of go prepared for anything, and then along the way, we kind of constantly update our own little risk assessment on our heads as the weather develops en route. It looks like it's as windy or windier out here as it was back at home plate. The seas are kicking too, huh? Yeah, pretty nice swell on the right side. Pond, 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 pond. Hello, station. This is United States Coast Guard Tech to Juno. A 406 megahertz e perp distress beacon has been received by satellite. A 31 foot single masted sailing vessel with body hull. All stations having seen or knowing the whereabouts of this vessel are asked to contact the Coast Guard. Keep a sharp lookout for signs of distress and assist if possible. Break. We're about 17 minutes out. Is the C-130 already on scene, sir? Uh, that's a really good question. Coast Guard Rescue 1704, Coast Guard Rescue 603, Channel 22. Coast Guard Rescue 1704, how you guys doing today? Still pretty good. I'm Lieutenant Commander Beth Fielder, and I'm a C-130 pilot here at Air Station Kodiak. We were talking to the H-60 well before they got on scene. We wanted to verify their ETA, and 
and sort of get an idea of what course of action we were going to take once we were all on scene. Well, it looks nasty down there. Yeah, it is. It's right down here someplace. Man. Jeez. Really messy, ECAX. Yeah, ECAX, back to call. We're in the vicinity of the lap long We're just trying to find you, DCS. Negative, let me poke my head out. Yeah, negative, negative. Just a lot of water. We're going to keep on looking for you here. Uh, I have been moving quite a bit uh, because with the drift and whatnot. I hailed the vessel on channel 16 to try to get in touch with him to verify his position so that we could go directly to him and save some time. He gave us a good coordinates. We went to that position. Uh, however, the seas were very rough. It was eight to 10 foot seas out there. The winds were blowing at 40 knots. So it was difficult to spot him. Okay, so he's real close to the left side someplace, guys. Yeah, I got nothing on radar. There is. Target in sight, 1 o'clock low, so mass is up. Okay. Or 11 o'clock low, got him. Uh, I don't see him, no. Nope. Right there, right there, right there. Low, in sight, yeah. okay. He's got his sails down. Yep. Okay. Come left, give me a mark. And let the helo know. 3804, we have the target acquired. He is just off of our left side, about two miles. And they have the sails down, so they're a little hard to see. Okay, roger that from, uh, sure. We're there right nearby, fellas. You guys see these guys? We're looking right now, sir, and I don't see anything quite yet. As we got on there and started circling and orbiting, the C-130 identified the boat and said, it's behind you. Um, so at that point, we realized, OK, he's, he's being pushed around, and he's moving quite a bit through the weather that we have on scene. At that point, we made a turn back to his last known position from the C-130 and was able to spot him at that point visually. Oh, there they are. Uh, 1130. Yep. Got yeah, them in sight. OK, it's 1704. We've got them in sight now. So we got on scene with the skipper on the radio. We brought him up on channel 16 and started talking to him. Um, and then we asked him what his current situation was. Sailing vessel ETAC. Good afternoon, sir. Just want to see what's going on down there. Yeah, I've got uh, no water coming in board currently. There's a couple small leaks on deck. I've got no power, though, uh, no engine. I've already suffered numerous knockdowns, and uh, my fear was that the next one might inflict uh, some further damaging wounds, uh, leaving me in the water. Uh, so that's the reason for my call today. Cam, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give him a shout. Absolutely. All right, sir. Sailing back with you, guys. Coast Guard helicopter. Sir, it sounds like you're having kind of a rough ride down there. I guess our biggest concern is we don't want you going in the water if you suffer another major knockdown or that could result in your vessel swamping or foundering. Well, I've been uh, yeah, out and about now for eight days. Wow. Uh, weathered this storm for the past 36 hours, essentially. And again, uh, numerous knockdowns. Uh, the waves stayed, sea states be uh, inclement to say the least. Breaking waves, I've tried nearly every uh, strategic tactic as far as weathering the storm. How would you feel about coming off your vessel this afternoon? How would you feel about coming off your vessel this afternoon? Yeah, okay, I guess life is the most important thing. Yeah, but you get dressed out, man. I'm uh, getting everything ready here. Once we established that he did, in fact, want to come off the vessel, it just became a question of what's the safest way to do that in the, in the way that provides the least risk to him and the least risk to us. Ultimately, we decided we need to put our rescue swimmer down there. I think it's safer since he's got a survival suit on to uh, have our swimmer escort him into the water. So it being a 31-foot sailboat with a mast, we decided it wasn't the best idea to hoist me directly to the boat, and we chose sling deployment considering the conditions and the wind, which means I would just get hoisted down into the water, swim up to the boat, establish communications with the captain, and then go from there. Swimmer's ready. All right, begin the hoist. Roger. Swimmer's outside the cabin door and going down. Swimmer's going down. Swimmer's holding five feet off the water. Roger. 420. And Star is in the water. And he's away. And he is back and left. 
go, Cam. That's what you can. It can be rather deceiving from the air when you're looking down uh, at a boat. It can appear to be not moving, and then once you get down in the water, you realize how fast it really is moving just from the winds. And we took this into account, and we had the captain tie off a buoy to a long line and throw it over uh, the stern of his boat so I could just grab that line and pull myself in. I can see it's pulled pretty good by the boat. Yeah, when, once he hit the water, he went just duck straight under that uh, sling and took off like a madman. The second I get down to the boat, I'm like, holy cow, this guy's been out here for eight days and just, and the, you know, the swells have been getting bigger and smaller and just constantly changing. And he's doing really well. However, the boat's not doing so well. The captain lost all propulsion and power. So that means he was not able to put the bow of the vessel into the swell. It was taking it on the port side, which means that the vessel was just rocking and rolling heavily. And he actually explained that the mass had touched the water at one point. I didn't want to have to go through that with him on the boat. So he secured everything that he needed to do, tied everything down. So for best case scenario, the boat does make it. And then after that, it was just time to get him in the water and hoist him away. All right, looks like I get ready. They're in the water. Ready for one basket recovery of the from the water. We both jumped off the boat together, and after that, I needed to keep him in close, in control for a buddy tow. So pretty much, I'm just grabbing him and swimming him over to away from the boat into the position that the helicopter wants us to be in. Roger, port and right, 20. Port five, easy forward and hold. Put the survivor in the basket. The biggest concern is just trying to keep up and time the waves right and making sure that I'm not paying out too much slack to get the cable tangled around them and making sure that I don't have too little paid out so that it pops the, the basket out of the water when they're not ready for it. I have ready for pickup. Big waves are going through. And hold, prepare to take the load. Take the load. And the control driver is back in the water. That wave popped her free. And the basket's coming up. We'll get you back and left. Survivor's coming up. Roger. Bringing the survivor inside the cabin. Survivor's out of the basket and ready to deploy the basket. After a successful completion of the hoist of the survivor, uh, it's just my job to get hoisted out of there too. Basket's inside the cabin. Hoist complete. And ready for forward flight. How are you doing? Fantastic, sir. And you are bugging when you hit that water. And 1704 from the uh, 38. 38 from the 04, we're just about bingo fuel. We're about ready to climb back up unless you guys need us uh, for the transit back home. I'll let you guys coordinate with the sector. Or is that what's going to my finger? Chop that one up in the books. That's a wrap. One life saved, baby. Once we departed scene on the flight back, it seemed like the weather was improving. In fact, at one point, we saw the sunshine and a little blue sky peek out on the way home. So uh, that, was, that made the flight back uh, pretty easy, a little lower stress. Um, and then uh, our survivor in the back, I think, was happy to be on the way home as well. Hey, sir, are we going to take him to Sitka? Yeah, we have a evacuation today with uh, sufficient fuel. I'm Rory Williams. I had just purchased a new vessel in Valdez, and the plan was to get it back here to, to Sitka, Alaska. Weathering storms is all part of the journey, you know? Within 20 hours, there was a 45 millibar drop in pressure, which essentially says that you need to seek refuge. But where I was, there was nothing I could do. After spending a couple nights in a survival suit, curled up in the fetal position, tucked in a nook and cranny in my boat, lying broadside to waves. I felt like I was, um, I was as good as dead, wondering if I was gonna get hurtled or tossed or knocked down again. Waves were breaking that smashed you on one side or the other. 
and there was just nothing you could do. It was just, it was, it was survival conditions, I, w I would say. I mean, I eventually resorted to the last resort, which is a resource that nobody likes to have to use, but when it's there, you're glad that it's there, the Coast Guard. Sector Juno, we are flight ops normal. We're in the thick of sound right now, about five minutes out from making our final approach to Air Station Sika. Over. We always say, oh, it's not going to happen to me, but you know what? When it happens to you and you see the blades chop, chop, chopping up top, it's kind of amazing. And it warmed your heart a little bit, you know? And uh, it made you know that at least you weren't alone out there. This was sort of that stereotypical, you know, when you think about the Coast Guard, you think about high seas rescue, and that's kind of what this was. We were to get this guy safely off his boat, safely back to the air station, and uh, kind of helped him out on what might have been the worst day of his life. I think the crew felt pretty good about that. As I'm going out the door, I see that the CPR is being done. So first thought right there is that this needs to be a fast evolution. I need to work smoothly and quickly. Family member, his son's there, and he's the one doing the CPR. So right from the start, it's a it's a tough, emotionally charged situation. Chris is working hard down there. Oh, buddy, be alive. AST3, Cameron Cullen, here in Sitka, Alaska, and this is Mount Verstovia Trailhead. We plan on hiking to the top, staying the night, and doing a bunch of snowboarding early in the morning. We just rescued a man in some pretty big waves, and now that I have the day off, it's great to see the brighter side of Mother Nature. Sika is just absolutely beautiful. This is only a couple miles away from my doorstep, and just to be able to park at sea level and be able to hike up 3,000 feet, and it's just, just a whole new world. It's really beautiful. Right now on top of Picnic Rock, this is gonna be the first run of the day. Just a little warm up. Phew. That was sick. Got my first couple runs in. It was really fun, tons of powder. And right behind me, we got uh, Mount Verstovio. I've had a goal for a while that I wanna go down the center mass of the mountain and see if I can uh, conquer that chute. I've been trying to do this specific run since I've been here in Sitka, which is a little over two and a half years. So it feels good to have all the right conditions to finally get this done. This is freaking awesome up here. All right, doing it now. I felt like a little kid up there. There's just uh, such a rush to be standing up there at the top. Once you start going down the mountain, you just you know work so many hours and hiking up. There's no other feeling like it, especially when there's so much powder. You just feel like you're floating on air. At the very end of the run, you feel the adrenaline dump, and you realize what you just put your body through. There's just a really euphoric feeling. It's awesome. I joined the Coast Guard when I was 18 years old. I just knew that I wanted to be in the military, but I had no idea that I would end up at such an amazing place like this. Lieutenant Brooks Crawford, one of the pilots here at Air Station Sitka, and we got word that uh, there's a heart attack victim on a charter vessel out by Bjorka Island. In this particular instance, all they can do is CPR. I don't know what kind of equipment they have on board, so that really shortens our timeline, makes it a, a pretty urgent case. Okay, you guys got the litter all set up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Radar 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 Radar. Radar. Okay. 
All right, so a guy on a 25-foot uh, boat, I'm guessing there's probably not a whole lot of uh, great areas to hoist you on this thing. I've got a boat inside, I think that's him. So we knew from the vicinity of where uh, this was taking place that it was gonna be a quick hop, and the only way to get this individual off was definitely by helicopter. We're probably there within five to six minutes. This is a very short time to prep and, and get everything ready for something that could be major. I'm pretty sure this is the vessel up here. And uh, Captain, this is Coast Guard Rescue 6030. Is your uh, patient, uh, is he still unconscious? Still unconscious. Find uh, a pulse right now. Okay, uh, Roger. Uh, overhead at this time, uh, are you able oh, to, uh, to the right. keep underway for us to do a hoist? Yeah, uh, if you want me to move uh, a certain direction, let me know. Yeah, Roger, Captain. Uh, we've got a quick hoist for you if you're ready to come. Yeah, step down there. The white one? Yes, sir, to the right. Okay, got there, it. I'll give it a okay, there, I'll give you Okay, I'll copy uh, that. that. Captain, uh, we've got a quick voice brief if you're ready to come. Yeah, step down there. The white one? Yes, sir, to the right. Okay, got there, it. There, I'll give it a Okay, there, I'll copy that. that. Hoisting the vessels is one of the primary things that we train for. It's kind of our, uh, our bread and butter, you might say. Um, and although we train very often, uh, we stay very proficient with that, there's always uh, you know, risks and danger associated with that kind of an evolution. You've got somebody swinging below the aircraft, trying to go to a very small platform. The whole boat was 25 foot long, and the aft portion that he was trying to go to was even smaller than that. And it also had three people already on it, working frantically. Okay, this is gonna be a harness deployment of the rescue swimmer to the uh, boat underway. We'll do this, uh, it's a pretty small boat. We'll have to do this from about 30 feet. Roger, right, someone's coming to the door. Okay, can you go, go to check him, please? The uh, heart attack victim, he was unconscious. So automatically you're thinking you, you want to get this guy as fast as possible to, to higher medical care. So we're not seeing it. You want to bridge that gap between him being out there offshore to back here into the hospital where he could receive that urgent care that he needed. Everybody's ready. Begin the hoist. Roger, bring it from outside the captain door for low check. Low check, swimmer. Low check, fleet. Swimmer is going down. As I'm going out the door, I see that the CPR is being done. So first thought right there is that this needs to be a fast evolution. I need to work smoothly and quickly and efficiently. Swimmer is going down. Swimmer is on deck. Swimmer is OK. I immediately disconnect, I uh, signal to the plane and have them push off a bit so I can start talking to the individuals. Come to find out that they just started CPR about 10, 15 minutes or so before we got on scene. You know, the family member, his son's there and he's the one doing the CPR. So right from the start, it's a, it's a tough, emotionally charged situation. Chris is working hard down there. Oh, buddy, be alive. I assessed, make sure he had no pulse. Uh, as soon as I confirmed that he didn't, then I started breaking out the O2 and, and started getting uh, an airway into him. All right, uh, looks like, yeah, the guy's out. So we might as well uh, get ourselves set up. We know what's coming next. We know this is already a very time critical situation, and uh, there's a lot of things to talk about and a lot of things to accomplish. Off of the litter. Okay. Roger that. Rescue briefing. Trail line delivery of the litter to the swarmer on the boat. Everything else remains the same. Any questions? No questions there. All right, coming out to 30 feet. At this point, Chris calls for the litter, and that's actually a multi-step operation. First, we have to put a tray line outside the helicopter and move in. Tray line is on deck. Tray line is next to the hoist hook. Litter is going outside the cabin door. When we deliver the litter outside the helicopter, it has a tendency to swing. And with the rescue swimmer holding that tray line, it helps us get it on board more quickly. Litter is necessary to the vessel, hanging on cable. The litter is on deck and being tended. Roger. At that point, he has to package up uh, the survivor in the litter. He'll do that with the help of the people on board. All right, there's the ready to pick up. Roger, that target is safe. Hooks outside, come to hooks going down. And finally, we have to hoist up uh, the survivor in the litter. Hook is on deck. Hook is being headed. Swimmer is hooking. Swimmer is hooked to the litter. Hold position. Roger. Chris had the victim strapped into the litter pretty good, and they were still giving them CPR until the last second, until, I mean, the guys were doing a heck of a job on the boat. Everyone was, was helping out, and uh, Chris gets me ready for pickup, and we con in, and we pick up the litter, clear them off deck, and back off, and uh, start bringing them up. Positions now, see they're good. Roger. Litter is coming up now. He's clear at the bottom of this helicopter. Roger. I'm going to be bringing them in here. OK, great job. 
But it's coming inside the cabin door. Roger, that's why over there. Let's get closer to him so we want to pick him up as soon as we can. Once the individual is actually into the helo, I'll just give a real quick hand signal. Uh, I'm ready for pickup. Somewhere is outside the cabin. Somewhere is inside the cabin. Point complete. Once I'm disconnected from the hook and the sliding door is closed, I know I need to start my CPR again. Just keep the airway going, make sure that he's got oxygen in him, and start defibrillating him if it, if it calls for it. Coast Guard, Mr. Juno, will be on deck circa zero 07 minutes. Chris was immediate like a spark plug. He didn't miss a beat. All of his attention and, and everything was, was right back on the victim. He was drenched in sweat, but that didn't slow him down at all. He just kept going. His main priority and focus was continuing vitals on this victim. How's the patient doing in the back, guys? He's uh, well conscious there. We're uh, cutting his clothes off. And... OK. CPR. CPR in itself is very tiring, especially for us while we're in the back of a bouncing helicopter with very, very little room where you can't get to his head or one leg's on a seat and the other one's underneath it. It's like trying to do it in a closet with the door shut. It's not easy and it's very exhausting. And crew for approach. Ready for At this point, we're acutely aware of uh, what's going on in the back of the helicopter. Uh, Chris is working to the very best of his abilities. Nick is doing the same. They're doing everything possible to help the survivor. We're approaching the air station as quickly as possible, and we see exactly what we want to see, that being EMS waiting for us. Yes, sir. We land to the ramp, taxi over quickly, and then we just leave the engines and rotors turning and allow Chris and Nick to help with that litter and get the, get the patient over to the ambulance. You know that this individual's life is literally in your hands. The whole case was such a short time that there was no time to feel tired. You know, tired will come later when it's all done. I need to get him off this plane and into that ambulance as fast as possible. The faster I can do it, the higher care he gets, the better chance he has of living. You know, it's up to us to do our very best to give everything that we have and everything that we've trained for to help a person who's in need. But quickly you learn, you know, that uh, you can't always save the day. All you can do is all you can do. And in the end, that's, uh, that's what it's about. What are you doing? I'm in Sitka, Alaska right now. It was the day before we get to start a three-day fishing tour. The three-hour tour, not the three-hour tour, but the three-day tour. 10 hours, of, 10 hours a day? 10 hours a day, fishing with my son. Oh, a dream come true. We've always wanted to go to Alaska and go fishing. We've talked about it since he was three years old. Here we are. My name's Elijah. My dad was uh, 62 years old. Um, when, when he passed on. So, uh, tomorrow's gonna be big fishing. That's it. Yeah, I agree. I always wanted to take him on his dream vacation. And to him, that was an Alaskan fishing adventure. He gets this fish and he's got it hooked in good and he's reeling for, I don't know, probably about five or 10 minutes he's getting his fish in. So I grabbed the camera and I took a couple of still photos and probably within five or six seconds of that is when he had had his, his heart attack. Immediately when he hits the ground, it's basically like the worst case scenario that you could possibly imagine. You're in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. You have no immediate access to healthcare. When I saw the Coast Guard's helicopters coming, it was almost like angels in the sky. There really are no words to express the gratitude that I have for those individuals that came to our aid that day. You must be made of such good substance to put yourself behind others. And I can't thank those individuals enough for their service. And if there is anything that I could do, it would be help to make their job easier. There could have been something that would have really that helped us that day that, to save him, you know? And that's, of course, the AED that we, we didn't have on board.
Hey, next, we'll go through the escapes and releases. I'll jump in the water and we can do the approaches, front surface, rear surface approach, underwater approach. Here at Air Station Sitka this week, we're having a standardization test. The standardization team, when they come, they're, they're usually testing us on our, our bread and butter. Our main job is search and rescue over the water. We'll go into the front and rear escape and then the front and rear release. My name is AST-1 Neil Cahoon. And what I'm doing is I'm from uh, Aviation Training Center, Mobile, Alabama. Today I'm going to be doing a search and rescue check and a standardization check with AST-2 Chris Belisle. His evaluation will consist of a PT test in the pool, and we'll follow that with a flight. Go, go, we have to do what's called as our life-saving drills, and that's how we approach different victims, forward, reverse, uh, actively drowning, victims that grab us, how do we escape from them, how we release from them. Whenever you guys are ready, go for it. The stand check, it's really important for us to do, especially the older guys like myself. You know, you've been doing this for a long time. You can get complacent. So as per our earlier brief, we'll start off with a uh, free fall deployment of the survivor. I'll be acting as a duck in the water, and he is the rescue swimmer. And I'm going to evaluate him on how he actually rescues me. Swimmer's away. Swimmer's in the water. Roger, roger. Pass is going outside the cabin door. Pass going down. Board right 10. There are some nerves there. I mean, it's nothing overempowering where you just can't do it. It's more of the, you know, what's he going to do while I'm out there. And it's nothing that I can't handle, but it's just a little on edge of what it is. Taking a loop. And bass is clear of the water. Clear move back and left. Roger. Clear left. All the Coast Guard's air crews are required to fly and uh, perform it in a standard way. And what this enables us to do is air crews from Sitka here can meet up with air crews from, say, Clearwater, Florida for a Hurricane Katrina type event, and they can mix air crews, jump on one airplane, and everybody knows what everyone else is doing. Forward, hold. Swimmer survivor at length. This is good. Swimmer survivor, clear the water. Third move up, back and left. Chris did an excellent job on his entire flight. He is one of the instructors here at Air Station Sitka. It's apparent that he's been in the books. He knows his job. He's a professional at what he does. We're ready for approach. Good relight, back. The stand check went really well. It was a really good day, and it was fun. You get uh, box lunches, snacks, something? Uh, I'll see if I get some. They said we're going to pick up at a net island. They're still sorting out if we're going to go to Wolf Point or to the airport. Okay. Uh, we'll get that information in route, but they got two hours to figure that out. Uh, Telecommander Doug Atkins at Coast Guard Air Station, Sitka, Alaska. We got a call about 4.30 this morning for a medevac for a young child, a two-year-old girl, and she has some pretty severe abdominal pains right now. And they're particularly concerned because she had appendicitis uh, a couple months back, and they're not sure if it's complications from that. So they want to get her off Metlakatla, which is a small, largely native Alaskan village, off of the island of Annette, and over to Ketchikan to the hospital. All right, flight plan loading. And rudder engagement area is clear. All right. So we get airborne out of Sitka, just a little bit after sunrise. The flight to Metlakatla from Sitka is about two hours normally. Unfortunately, we had to buck some you know, 30 to 40 on headwinds. And with the headwinds, it could take us up to about two and a half hours this morning. The wind's pretty much coming right off the nose and slowing us down a good bit, so. That's again from 30. We're just taking off from home plate. We're heading out to do for good. Up. Yeah, it'll cut a little down draft there. Yeah. We're going to get you this little more finger swept down here. So. What the weather's gonna look like when we get down there. Everybody's still doing okay in the back? Yes, sir. Ready for a cup of coffee. <laughs> we'll pull off up here. When you have an emergency, and especially in southeast Alaska where the area is so big, our uh, transit time's almost two hours. Mind if I get on gunner's belt and start uh, collecting some stuff? Yeah, that's fine. Roger. For me, as the medical technician, one of my first thoughts is, you know, how bad is this young child? So many things can go wrong. You know, have they been up all night, which makes them even crankier? Uh, are they going to be afraid of what's going on with the noise of the helicopter and, you know, these big, strange people coming in with big helmets and loud noises? So, Petty Officer Dunn and I are talking about what we're going to do when we get on scene. And I'm really thinking about, you know, all the scenarios of what could be wrong with this child and what I can do to mitigate it. She'll sit here, we'll put mom on the inside, we'll put her over here. 
Um, I'll have you come out with me. You can give Mom a brief real quick. If for some reason it's gotten really bad, our last throw right on a litter and we'll go from there. Already gone, and for approach. Five minutes out now. Ready for approach. We got some altitude work with right here at least. And sector from 30, call us on scene. We are landing at this time at uh, an air airport. Air ambulance right there. We arrive on scene. Yep. First responders from Metlakatla are waiting there with the ambulance, which is exactly how we like to do a medevac to get there and have the patient standing by so it uh, makes, uh, makes the fastest possible turnaround to get the patient to the hospital where they need to be. Responding to a call for a two-year-old with abdominal pain. As soon as we landed and everything was safe and secure on deck, I just got out and made my approach to the ambulance. The uh, swimmer went and checked on the patient, and I took the guardian to the side, gave her a pre-brief for riding in the helicopter. You know, you could tell that she was nervous about what was going on with her daughter. Briefed her on how to don the MAC-10 and try to comfort her as much as we can and make everything as easy as possible for the short transit to catch can. The decision for us to bring along the mother was a really big one, especially with little children. They feel safer with their family around, obviously. You know, you're able to talk to the mother calmly and in a nice, safe setting while I was finishing up with the paramedic inside the ambulance. Coming in now, Jason. She's been tired through the night, so she just kind of rolled up into my arms, and I just picked her up and carried her like a child. All right, we're ready, officer. Okay. Yeah, we're ready to take off, guys. Yeah, the flight from Metlakatla over to Ketchikan is only about 10 minutes, but we are going to be crossing, uh, you know, open water to get over there. So we're going to take all the same safety precautions we take for any flight in Alaska. But anytime you deal with a child case, you know, a lot of us are our parents. We have kids. So if it's my child, you know, I'm going to be pretty emotionally involved in that. So I'm glad I can help somebody else out. And Get their, get their kid the, you know, the care they needed. When we land, we'll just do an opposite of what we did. Take her out first, get her out of the way, and then I'll just carry her out and put her in the ambulance. OK. The little girl was tired, and she slept for most of it. So my job was relatively easy, uh, just making sure that she was comfortable and was laying down, wasn't rolling around and pulling out her IV, making sure that the mom's comfortable and buckled in. And before you know it, we were landing on deck at Ketchikan. Mains are over. This medevac went uh, about as well as they could go. The EMS folks from Met were right on. They were there when we got there. We were able to get the patient transferred in just a couple of minutes and uh, where she needed to be. It's pretty routine for us doing this case, but I always good to remember, you know, certainly not a routine for a mom and her, her two-year-old getting taken out in the you know, middle of the morning in a Coast Guard helicopter. Certainly a big deal for them, so I always try to keep that perspective, and uh, you know, we're always going to try to do the best we can for everybody we're helping out. Thank you. Ariel, it was a pleasure. Sorry, we couldn't meet like this. Yeah. Next time we'll be happier days. Okay. Bye, guys. It definitely feels good going home at night to my family, knowing that you know the Coast Guard's there and is able to help people. If I was in their position, I would definitely want the Coast Guard to be there for me. So it's a good feeling working for this organization. My name's Elijah Freeman. We're in Sitka, Alaska, and it's been a year since I've been here. I've been invited to come back, just reunite with the team that worked so diligently on my father, trying to keep him alive. And, you know, it was kind of odd, but I kind of felt like I was coming to visit my dad on the way here. Elijah. Hey. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> I'm well, how you doing? Good, good. It's Chris. <laughs> yeah. Never forget good. those eyes, man. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Nick, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Howard. Howard. Nice to meet you. Thank you, oh, thank yeah. you. Ron, come on, Gaffin, Ron. <laughs> oh, man, nice to see you, brother. How you doing? Good, good to see good, you. Good, good. Is that Pops? Yeah, it's Pops. Oh. <laughs> wow. So it's a, this is the pole my, my father caught his fish on. Yeah. So, wow. So that's good luck today. That's yeah, good. It better on. be, yeah. yeah. Today, we're going to go fishing on the Carpe Diem, which is kind of fitting to seize the moment, so to speak. Really, today's fishing trip is about celebrating the memory of my father. I'm just here to be with my dad today and the people who were 
on that boat and on that helicopter who tried to save my dad. There's one. Chris on. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Always fighting now. Here he comes. Hey. He got out. Uh, He's right there at the end. He popped we'll right get him. Yeah. Just took my first fish and it got off. So I think somewhere uh, my dad's up there laughing at me. Come on, Elijah. There we go. Let's get it. Flooded full of emotions being that we're actually in the place where my father last lived. You know, he, he caught his last fish here. I feel very satisfied now that I've, I've been able to come back to the place that me and my dad last were able to speak and have fun and enjoy a father-son relationship. Here it comes. He's a big boy. Yeah. Holy! Look at that! Boy. <laughs> yeah! That's my boy! There you go. There you go. That's a nice fish right there. You, you want? There you go, pal. That's the biggest one I've seen. That one's for you, Dad. Sorry about my French. I apologize. No, you're good, man. Coming out today was definitely a good time. Good closure for the case and everything. Elijah was able to pull in an above average size king salmon, which kind of sealed the deal. It made it all worthwhile for everyone out here today. Hi, right, Pop. We love you. Putting my father's ashes in the place that he uh, last wished that he would be, you know, is very fulfilling to myself spiritually and who I am as an individual. Thanks, guys, for taking me out today. I mean, this is something that I, you know, I can't ever repay you for and for everything that you've done representing the Coast Guard, representing everyone here in Sitka that, that fishes and takes people on their life dreams. I couldn't tell you guys how, how much I, I truly thank you from the bottom of my heart. Keep up the good work. Man, fellas. <laughs> when you look up at the sky and you know that there are a group of people, men and women both, willing to lay their lives on the line every day to keep people like me and my father safe out here. I'm very honored to be a part of that system, to know that we have men and women like that who are essentially fearless and want to help others. I can't thank these individuals enough.